My name is Martin Pratchett. I'm the Engineering Practice Manager here at Engineering New Zealand. And in conjunction with our engagement team and uh, huge contributions from our technical groups, we uh, run these Lessons to be Learned um, webinars every month. And on that note, uh, we have had a webinar fall through for next month. And so if anybody from a technical group is watching this and has one that they could step in for at short notice, then please pop your hand up and uh, and send us an email or put your details into the chat so that we can um, so that we can get something sorted out. Uh, my pleasure today to um, well, first of all, introduce the introducer uh, who is uh, John Leeswin. And he is joining us from Canterbury, a uh, member of the transportation group, and will be uh, talking about the host of the webinar. And from now on, I will be handing over to you. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Martin. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the transportation group. In case you don't already know about the transportation group, it is about uh, 1,100 members. Um, there's a, a whole host of benefits from membership, and um, Bernie will be sharing a link to a flyer about it, as well as a link to how to join Transportation Group. Um, Transportation Group is very pleased to have Peter McGlashan uh, speaking to us all today. Uh, Peter is a lead advisor in urban mobility, multimodal and innovation at Waka Kotahi New Zealand Transport Agency. He's worked in transport, higher education, media, broadcasting, and the social development sectors. You might also recognize his name as he is a former cricketer. He represented New Zealand in 11 2020 internationals, four one-day internationals, and um, his athletic background, I think, is um, has parlayed into uh, his current work as an active transport uh, specialist and advisor. Since 2019, he's served uh, on a local board at Auckland Council. And um, I first saw him present at the Transportation Group Conference in 2021. His presentation was called Letters from the Frontline, Low Traffic Neighborhoods, PTSD. And uh, with that said, he has now worked for over a year at Waka Katahi and is going to be expanding on that um, short plenary presentation with um, new knowledge. So over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, John, for that very warm introduction. It's not very often that cricketers get described as athletes, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, my uh, I'm not an engineer. Um, uh, I guess the, the closest connection that I've got to engineering is, is my degree at university was biomechanics, sport and exercise science. And so uh, I, I spent my time at university and, and spent my time growing up pulling things apart and trying to work out how to put them back together. And for me, it was the analysis of the human body and how, um, as athletes, we interact with physical equipment that led to me uh, doing my own design work uh, while I was playing cricket. So uh, I've left that uh, behind a while ago, um, but it's always nice to come across some people who um, want to talk cricket. Uh, so, ko hakarangi te maunga, ko waiaputa uh, awa, ko harauta te waka, ko ngati prau te iwi, uh, ko rakai hoia te hapu, ko kakariki te marae, ko Maglashan toku whānau, and ko Peter toku ingoa. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the warm introduction, uh, Martin and John. Um, as mentioned, uh, I have a role at Waka Kotahi uh, as the lead, as the uh, lead advisor in the urban mobility team. Um, it's an interesting story how I guess I've ended up here uh, speaking in this uh, time slot. Um, my presentation, as John mentioned uh, last time around, was Letters from the Front Line, LTN PTSD, and, and we kind of ended up, uh, I know engineers and, and particularly transport people are, are keen on acronyms, but we did end up, unfortunately, with this kind of image on the right-hand side, and so what I want to do is take you, I guess, through the journey uh, of trying to put in a low traffic neighborhood. Uh, in, at the time when I was trying to install it, I was a uh, politician 
Uh, I was the local board member for Auckland Council trying to install this in a local community as part of the Innovating Streets Fund, which was funded by Waka Kotei. Uh, and since then, and um, maybe as um, I'm a glutton for punishment, but now I, I'm employed at Waka Kotahi uh, after picking up a, a role last year in the urban mobility team, where um, I guess the role that I have at a local council level allows me, allows me to work with council officers and advisors so that they can make sure they get the best information to decision makers. But to kind of go back, uh, as John mentioned, you know, where he saw me last, um, it was only a few days ago that I realized that um, when John said, look, you can just roll out the presentation you did last time. Uh, and I was thinking, God, that doesn't ring a bell. I don't remember spending that long on a presentation. Uh, I've got a feeling this is a, you know, this is an hour slot. And sure enough, when I went back onto the presentation, I had a five minute speaking slot at the decarbonizing transport presentation. So it's fair to say the slide deck that I had last year uh, had to be padded quite a bit for today's presentation. So I apologize to those that were in the decarbonizing transport conference last year back in May. Uh, there'll be five minutes, which is very familiar. Uh, and then after that, we'll get onto a little bit more detail as to how we ended up where I did. Uh, which hopefully leads on to some questions about some of the lessons that can be learned from failure. Um, and particularly as engineers, because you guys have a critical role, I guess, um, uh, taking a project and a concept and an idea from uh, the formative stages into a place of construction and delivery, and then eventually the community get to enjoy that. So to go back a step again, my presentation uh, at the um, at the decarbonizing transport conference was about uh, something that happened to me uh, in the months earlier as part of my role for the Innovating Streets project. I want to take you back to Wednesday, the 17th of March, 2021, where I was asked to fill in for that time slot at four o'clock on the 17th of March, awaiting confirmation of name. Someone obviously pulled out and they needed someone at the last minute with a, an interesting story. And so I was drafted in to fill that spot at the two walk and cycle conference. What I didn't know is as I was waiting to kind of have that time slot and kind of be beamed into, I think it was in Dunedin, be beamed into Dunedin from where I was in Auckland, um, this was beginning to play out. The agenda was running late, so um, uh, it turns out that I'd be presenting at 4.30 rather than the original time slot. And at 4.21, uh, I was kind of sitting at my desk, just similar to I am now, having the laptop and everything open, ready to go, and something strange happened. I kind of felt a little bit lightheaded. Um, I had been working pretty hard on the Innovating Streets project, kind of um, battling away, which I'll touch on later on. But fortunately, I had a had an Apple Watch. I have an Apple Watch. And for those of you who don't know, the Apple Watch, uh, the latest ones now, can just do a one lead ECG on them. So you just hold the button uh, and just kind of relax. And then over the course of the 30 seconds, it'll record a one lead ECG. Now, one lead ECG is pretty basic. It's, it's effectively just trying to pick up one electrical signal in one direction. Uh, when you go into the hospital, you have lots of different leads all over you, and that's to pick up the kind of different directions of the electrical current so that um, when analysed, they can get a better picture of kind of how the heart is functioning electrically. Uh, electrically. Um, but this was a, an interesting opportunity to kind of use that. Um, I had had some heart, heart issues as sort of a 20 something uh, running around kind of, you know, my heart would start fluttering and, but generally I could calm it down, take a big deep breath and then it would go back into that rhythm, boom, boom, boom. But with about eight or nine minutes to go before my presentation, it looks like this. So you can see there, date of birth is wrong. I'm not sure how that happened. Maybe it's the US version. Um, but my heart rate while sitting at my desk was 222 beats per minute. Now that was a little bit confronting. Um, I was thinking maybe it's a little bit of nerves kind of leading up into this presentation, last minute throwing a presentation together. But 222 beats per minute is kind of a number that you shouldn't get up to even when you're exercising really, really hard. So I kind of knew that from memory, I think, you know, going back to my university days, it's kind of 200 and 
210, 220 minus your age. So, you know, if I'm 40, I should only really get up to about 180 beats a minute, even when I'm exercising as hard as possible. So if my heart rate is doing 222 beats a minute while I'm sitting at my desk doing nothing, something's up, something seriously up. Um, but I went on and I had to do the presentation. I managed to calm myself down just before it started. Heart rate went back to normal rhythm. Went home, told the wife she wasn't too happy. And that night I was in hospital. So this is the part which I will be a little bit familiar with the decarbonisation decarbonizing transport presentation um, but this is giving a little bit more detail I sat in the hospital overnight and as these things normally happen when you monitor that with all these electrical signals everywhere my heart behaved completely fine didn't didn't batter an eyelid um, and it wasn't actually until the next morning when the cardiologist came around and he said to me look I'm really sorry Peter that we haven't got anything on the monitors all night um, you're going to have to go home I said to him well actually can I show you what's on my phone so my ECG on my watch was sent to my phone. I showed him on my phone. He said, can you email that to me? And within 20 minutes, he came back and he said, you wouldn't believe it, but um, that's enough evidence for us to say uh, that this is serious. This is something serious. And if you hadn't caught it on your watch, we wouldn't have been able to act. So the kind of the message for that was really no project is worth dying over. Um, I'll touch on the diagnosis a little bit later, but um, you know, it really was a reminder to me that I had pushed my body to the limit to a point where it was beginning to fail. Um, and I needed to remember that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're holding the pen at the start of a project or in the construction on the high rise, you know, clipping in um, your harness to the ribbon cutting is really important to remember that no project is worth dying over. Uh, off the back of that diagnosis from my watch, uh, that was followed up with a proper ECG and sure enough it picked up an atrial fibrillation, which is basically where you have a short circuit, the current's supposed to kind of go uh, to the first uh, sinus node impulse down through the uh, ven um, a ventriculum and then back up and then down again and I basically had a short circuit which under stress poor electrolytes poor nutrition lack of sleep uh, meant that basically uh, the current wasn't going the full way around the circuit short circuiting and my heart rate was 220 beats a minute just sitting still so not the sort of thing that will kill you but the sort of thing that means if it happens while you're driving you'll basically like lose complete kind of um, you'll start to lose consciousness because of a, the heart is working too hard not enough blood is getting to where it needs to be because it's just in constant fluttering so within a week or so that led to a, an ablation operation where they go up through your groin and all the way up to your heart from the insides and it kind of reminded me of the fact that um yeah your kids won't care if your bridge won an award if they aren't there to walk if you aren't there to walk over it with them and I think that's something that we need to remember regardless of the role that we play within the process of these big projects is that if you push yourselves too hard regardless of whether you are sitting at a desk spending late nights kind of you know busting a gut to get a deadline done or not hooking your harness in at the top of a you know construction site um, wherever you are on the delivery timeline it's really important that we remember and, and thankfully you know I was at the Ngaho Mangari uh, opening the bridge the other day and uh, they and they they celebrated the fact that there'd been no lost time injuries uh, on that project and it's kind of how we should be thinking moving forward that's for sure but um, if you have had, had heart issues make sure you go out and get uh, an Apple watch or something like that because I wouldn't have got the treatment that I had if I hadn't been able to show them uh, that uh, fleeting moment um, and uh, provide that evidence which they couldn't capture in the hospital. So what led to the heart issues? What led to me pushing myself so hard um, that I was willing to sacrifice my own health? Going back again a bit further, so December 3rd or 4th in 2020, um, an idealistic group of myself as the local politician representing this community, a couple of community champions who were sick and tired of um, cars racing down the local streets, um, some people from Auckland Transport and others, had applied for the funding, the Innovating Streets funding, which Waka Kotahi was offering, and we had been successful. Our project was to install a couple of low traffic neighbourhoods, which had worked really well overseas, 
had been controversial overseas. We knew what we were getting ourselves into, but we hoped in the same way that New Zealand had learned from the COVID lessons from overseas, uh, we hoped that we could also learn from the low traffic neighbourhoods that were being done overseas a few months ahead of us. So the challenges that they were having publicly with public buy-in and um, misinformation and um, sheer frustration at uh, not being willing to wait for those behavior change elements to be seen in the real world. I mean, we knew what we were getting ourselves into. Um, we maybe naively thought that we could plan for those uh, and, and get ahead of them. But we put signs up all around the community, most of the lampposts around the, the area that we were focusing on, talking about what the project was about, talking about the, the, the when we were going to have a public meeting, talking about the website that you can go to provide feedback with a QR code, which you know people were familiar with. Uh, so we, we kind of did as much as we could on the ground with signposts and the places where people were walking so that they could get access to the information required. We had a pretty good turnout for our first public workshop, kind of 70 to 80 people probably in total over the day. Um, chance for them to hear about what a low traffic neighborhood is. Definitely some of them arrived thinking, you know, that we're seeing what they had seen in the UK and were pretty reticent about um, what we were proposing. But over the course of the presentation, and we were supported by Emma Cagney and some of the other organizations um, working on it and uh, um, Holistic Urban Environment, we, we felt like we won the audience over. We gave them an opportunity to provide um, feedback on the plans and we got really good buy-in. The community were able to walk through and identify the risks within their own neighborhood so that they could start to see that they were the ones coming up with the solutions to the problems. We had the technical expertise sitting in behind, ready to take their um, anecdotal um, frustration or um, potential accident and then start to work out technically what the solution for that would look like. So we felt like we had a good mix of collaborative design as well as um, subject matter experts in the rooms. As mentioned, Holistic Urban Environments uh, team did a great job of putting together designs with MR Cagney. Um, a wonderful combination of both the functionality that we needed to, to limit um, car movements in the locations that we were looking for, as well as creating places to, 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 to socialize, to meet uh, this particular corner uh, on the corner of Galway and Arthur has always been problematic for the community. They've spoken of lots of near misses uh, at this spot. Um, you know, we've spoken to hundreds of people standing on the street corners, kids walking to school through the public engagement and the lead up to the process of coming up with the designs. And this was kind of the most problematic uh, intersection in the neighborhood. So we felt like we'd done pretty well to get to the bottom of, of what they wanted. So then it was time to talk to the engineers on site. Um, and I never knew that we would spend so long talking about can you turn a rubbish truck round at the end of the street. It didn't seem to matter what all the other objectives of the project were. Um, uh, you know, we were constantly reminded of the fact that it'll be that one tiny little thing you haven't thought about, which you know brings a whole project um, grinding to a halt. So there was lots of conversations and lots of theoretical, hypothetical modeling done on, on rubbish truck turning circles, but it actually took us to go out on site and have a look at what the rubbish trucks were actually doing before we could get a feeling uh, for how it was possible. Because when you looked at it on a map, Technically, it wasn't possible for the rubbish trucks to do what they were doing. And as much as the managers said, the book says that they will be doing this. Sure enough, when we stood there um, uh, on the roads and actually had a physical truck in front of us and had them back it up and had us marking it on the ground, uh, we realized that sometimes the mathematical computer modeling doesn't always fit with uh, human beings, I guess, ability to problem solve on the spot. Again, information, we thought we were doing everything we could to get information out to the public. Um, these were the types of stories that were that were already running kind of before we decided to, to put the project in place uh, about speeding through the streets of Onihanga must stop. There'd been several serious accidents with some families um, really badly hurt. And so, you know, we kind of felt it was the right place, right time for a project like this. Uh, we felt the community were asking for it and we thought we were gonna be able to provide a solution uh, that they were wanting to the problems that they were facing. 
We tried to reach as many eyeballs as possible. Uh, we knew that these projects were going to be contentious. We knew that they were going to be challenging. Um, you know, we were asking an entire block to basically behave differently and over time learn different ways of moving around. And we were hoping that the benefits of limiting traffic moving through their neighborhood would be offset by the slight inconvenience of them maybe needing to do a slightly longer route to get to the supermarket or even better considering walking to the local shop or biking to the local shop uh, to pick up a couple of liters of milk rather than getting there in their car for those short two or three kilometer trips. Went along to the Unihanga Summer Festival and we tried to socialize the delivery timelines. We tried to get people to realize that this thing was coming. Uh, we didn't want it to be happening to them. We wanted um, them to have a good understanding of what the changes would be. This was a, a physical change to the, to the landscape, to the physical environment, but they also needed to um, be aware of what it meant for them personally. So if their morning trip to drop the kids at, at daycare uh, needed to be changed slightly, you know, obviously that's the thing you want to find out a couple of weeks in advance. You don't want to find it out the morning of. Um, it took a while for things like Google Maps to get updated with the changes. Um, Google Maps has been one of the biggest problems to transport planning. Uh, yes, it has made it easier for people to get the most out of the system by using all those little small streets as spillovers and um, pressure valves for when the main arterials are full. But it has meant that we've ended up with thousands and thousands of cars ending up down little um, residential streets that were never designed for the capacity that we are trying to push down or the algorithms are trying to push down them. So all the messaging at the Onehunga Summer Festival on the February 27th was we're going to start the letterbox drop this week. Um, we've spoken to as many people as possible to share what the ideas were, ask them where do you live, how will this affect you, have you thought about other ways, um, you know, let's talk about a, you know, what Monday might look like if you were to change your route. Why don't you use the next two weeks to practice the best new route for you before the changes are actually happening on the ground. This was the area that we were looking to do the letterbox drop. So the low traffic neighborhood is sort of the, the third in the middle. Um, and so we thought we had pretty good blanket coverage. Every single house in that pink um, uh, shape polygon was going to receive something in the letterbox explaining the project, explaining the project timelines, explaining the, the why and how we thought this was going to be important, um, you know, pointing to the website and all those things that people were going to need. Um, to find out all the information they needed uh, along the way to make choices so that this didn't come as a surprise on the first day. So as far as we could tell, on February 27th, things were going well. Uh, we even had the mayor along and, and you know, we, we shared with Mayor Phil Goff the fact that the information will be going to local residents in the area, um, advising of the construction deadline um, and that hopefully work will be starting on March the 8th. March the 8th, and we're on February 27th. And the next day, Auckland went into lockdown. And so all of the plans about letterbox drops across thousands of houses and everyone having the right information at the right time went out the window because the night after we'd been making all these promises at community days, all of Auckland went into level three. And in level three, um, it was decided by the companies that were doing the deliveries, by the construction guys, that they couldn't work at level three at that stage. Those were the rules. Um, and so that planned letterbox drop to say that on March the 8th, we're gonna start work, didn't happen. And so as much as we try to send out to our databases and put articles in the newspaper and try and reach people on Facebook, the closer and closer we got into that kind of two or three days of lockdown, four or five days of lockdown. Next minute, there's an announcement, March 7th, lockdown's finishing, yay. But we're starting installation on March the 8th. What do we do? What do we do? Do we pull the plug and say, look, actually, it doesn't matter that we won't be able to get the contractor back for another two or three months because they're fully booked. That's the right thing to do. Or, well, actually, I think we've done a pretty good job of reaching the community and we seem to be getting really good feedback so far. So let's push on. 
because there's a there's a real deadline with this project. There's a deadline with the funding. It all has to be wrapped up by uh, by the end of June. I think we can do this. I think we've got public buy-in. I think we've got a word we've found out now, which wasn't around at the time. I think we've got social license to carry on with this. So on March the 8th, the day after we dropped back from level three to level eight, on the same day as the flyers were going in letterboxes to say construction is starting, construction started. And so as much as we tried to use local businesses um, like the guys uh, from Pritchett who do the stenced, uh, um, pain and I've forgotten the first name um, stencils in Onehunga. We tried to use as many local businesses as we could. Uh, we didn't know the storm that was coming on the horizon. It started off the way that we'd hoped. We were having wonderful, beautiful images of kids riding bikes through the neighborhood and people talking about how wonderful it was to be able to hear the birds singing. It reminded them of the lockdowns that we'd had earlier where cars weren't allowed out on the road, kids could learn to buy, uh, to ride their bikes, uh, and people were walking around their neighbourhoods. We had a, a paint the crate day because someone at Auckland Transport uh, forgot to paint the crates uh, from the supplier. So, you know, we, we embraced that uh, adversity and we bought the crates in and we put them on site and we got the community along to paint the crates. And it actually turned out better than it ever would if they'd turned up pre-painted. Um, it was a wonderful day with again 70 or 80 people contributing all the kids got to do their own boxes um, and it was a chance for everyone to come together so this is kind of three or four days into the project at this stage we're thinking yes we've got a great balance of community buy-in um, we're telling the right stories in the right places um, everything's looking like it's going to go all right Kids were having a great time. This particular intersection was critical because it was where um, Onihanga primary kids walked east-west and uh, St. Joseph's uh, kids walked north-south. So this junction had always been high risk for the kids. And all of a sudden it became a real meeting point for them to walk and bike to school, which meant that mums and dads didn't have to uh, drop them off, which meant mum and dad had an extra 15, 20 minutes in the morning. Uh, it gave the kids more independence and obviously lower emissions, which is something that uh, Waka Kotahi and others are working on now. It looked like things were going well. The sun was out, community was really enjoying the spaces that we'd given them. And there was a real appreciation from at least this part of the population that uh, this project was doing exactly what we'd said it would do. Sure enough, there were doubters and we had face-to-face -face meetings. I think I'm even wearing the same shirt as that day to try and talk to people about their concerns. You know, how do I get from here to there? Um, what about a fire truck? Um, do the police know about this? All those questions were answered. We'd done all that background work. And so, you know, we did those face-to-face -face conversations as well. The challenge that we hadn't really considered is the fact the whole point of the project was to, to reduce rat running on these two streets. So with Mount Smart Road at the top of the pink box there, um, these two streets shown, Arthur and Gray, were used as shortcuts whenever that main arterial road filled, road filled up. And what was happening is 5,000 cars a day were going along these little residential streets and using it as a shortcut to get to who knows where. And that was the problem. We had planned to tell the people on the streets where the project was going. We'd planned to tell the story to the wider population through the local newspaper, um, through the local Facebook pages. What we hadn't factored in is we had no idea where those 5,000 people were coming from or going to and how to reach them. So the day we put the boxes in was where we, when we realized that those people weren't local. Those people weren't in the pink area that was receiving the letterbox drop. Those people lived in Hillsborough and they wanted to get to East Tamaki for work. They lived in Mount Roskill and they wanted to get to... Monaco. They weren't listening, they weren't reading the local newspaper, they weren't on the local community Facebook page. The only way we were ever going to find them is by putting the boxes in the middle of the road and then realizing the day they came to take their shortcut on the first day, it wasn't an option. So it was a real hard lesson in 
you can plan as much as you want, but there will always be elements which are, are uncontrollable. And I guess having come from a professional sporting background, you know, I was always more worried about controlling the controllables um, because there was always that sense in professional sport that, you know, the other team might have a good day or there might be something, uh, you know, in the, in the environment or preparation, which you just got to roll with it. You've just got to be flexible. So it wasn't until the boxes were put on the ground and we started to hear from these people who all of a sudden came to a grinding halt in the middle of Arthur Street and were bamboozled by this box appearing as if it, appe as if it had appeared from the sky, despite eight weeks of local community newspaper articles, Facebook posts, signs on lampposts, um, everything we could do to try and reach the people that we thought would be affected by the project. That became a real challenge. This is a beautiful design and it looked amazing, but it didn't take long before cars, despite signage, were trying to find ways to get from A to B to save themselves 90 seconds, maybe two minutes. And that was just a taste of what was to come. Didn't take long before the graffiti started and the vandalism of the boxes. Now, depending on how you place these boxes, it says we don't want and then road for cars. I mean, I guess if we relocated these boxes, maybe they're trying to say we don't want roads for cars. Um, but judging by the other messages that were painted on the boxes, these guys weren't on our side. And it became pretty clear that there was a portion of the population that were very unhappy with what we were doing. A petition was started and there was over a thousand people signed the petition and that got the local politicians nervous. The local politicians who felt they had the finger on the pulse of the community. A thousand person petition seems like quite a lot, but we were, we were having an intervention on a road which had 5,000 cars a day. We'd ask 5,000 people to take a different route. And only a thousand people had signed a petition. And this is a community of 25, 30,000. So on the surface, this petition of a thousand seemed like a lot of people. But I kind of hoped that people would see past that, particularly when you started to scratch below the surface of the petition. And there were 20 people from Rio de Janeiro who were passionate about the Onehanga low traffic neighborhood happening, and 15 people from Melbourne who didn't want the low traffic neighborhood to, to happen. And there were 45 people from Wellington who didn't want the Onehanga trial to happen. So there was a whole bunch of noise in the petition, which was the global reaction to low traffic neighborhoods, which we were seeing on the ground. We were not just facing physical warfare in the trenches with damage and destruction, but we were also facing digital warfare at home and work. Um, what probably led me going to hospital is trying to answer every single Facebook post, post to try and do the myth busting, to try and explain to people all the things that they maybe hadn't read the article or they hadn't picked up the email or they hadn't gone to the project's website. They were relying on community Facebook pages to be the source of truth on what the project was. So we tried to work really hard with the local newspaper and provide some balance. There were lots and lots of articles debating both sides of the project, but to the, the graffiti and vandalism just continued. We even faced trying to do the fact checking with the media. So this headline caused some problems towards the end. Uh, and I say the end, um, the project was only in place for a couple of months. Auckland local board spends $822,000 on plywood boxes to redirect traffic. Now that's a hell of a headline, considering the entire project only cost $400,000 and the plywood boxes were probably only $30,000. Uh, it took us too long to get a, a um, correction of that headline. The damage was already done. The rumors were already starting about us spending $800,000 on wooden boxes, even though that wasn't true at all. It became political. So both sides of the political party realized that there were some easy wins and easy votes to get if they chose a side. Um, and one of the local parties decided uh, that they were going to side with the people vandalizing the boxes. And this was kind of the fatal end of the project. 
this is an image of some guys that we don't even know who they were with a forklift during rush hour traffic and a pry bar removing the traffic control devices from the road while it was live. Not Auckland Transport removing them, just some guys in high vis with their own forklift from work, removing all these things which had official resolutions and you know, had, had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars with all the experts making sure that these things were legally compliant and removing them. And it wasn't long before cars driving through uh, just became too much of a risk because none of the lines on the ground matched the behavior of the cars because none of this area was supposed to be open to vehicles during the trial due to the blue boxes. So sure enough, the project was halted due to safety reasons, uh, which is a real shame because we never got a chance to see whether it was actually going to do what we thought it would. This is the feedback that we got afterwards when we did the surveys. And you can see the larger images there, talk, uh, less is saying less cars, safer, good, safe. Overall, people thought it was ugly. That was fine. We could have painted the box any color they wanted. I was more worried about the functionality of the trial. But unfortunately, um, as we saw, uh, people took things into their own hands and the trial didn't see itself through. This kind of topped it off for me. Um, this was kind of when I decided I won't be going back to Onihanga for a while. Um, this graffiti on the Te Papapa train station saying Councillor Peter McGlashan is a crook, call the police. I found ironic that they were breaking the law and suggesting the police should come have a look at me. Uh, they'd also given me a promotion because I was only a local board member, uh, the level below councillor. And just for that real nail in the coffin, um, this took about four days to remove because it was on Auckland Transport and Auckland Council were arguing over whether it was Auckland Transport's job to remove it because it was at a train station or Auckland Council's job to remove it because uh, it was a public space. So this set up for four days while the locals of Wanihanga <laughs> um, thought that I was a crook. So to finish up, um, yeah, failures are only failures if you don't learn from them. Um, courage is needed to make bold decisions. People may despise now, but thank you for later. Uh, and for those of you that may be Snowpiercer fans and are a bit um, frustrated that that series is not gonna be repeated due to a hostile takeover in the entertainment world, um, I really do like this quote. Um, Standing fast in the face of doubt, especially their own, is what a leader has to do. Um, thanks very much for your time. And uh, yeah, I hope you've picked up some lessons from that. Kia ora. Thanks, Peter. That was uh, that was an excellent um, excellent presentation. There's a couple of questions. There's a couple of questions that have uh, come through. Uh, the first one that got asked was, "Did you think of doing a license plate survey, like to determine like to determine origin and destination?" A license plate survey. So I'm assuming what they're meaning is have someone stand there, record the license plates, and then try and contact the owner and then try and work out where they started and where they finished. I mean, I suspect if we had more time, we may have tried to do that. Um, I think at the time we were just, we were in the trenches and we were taking fire and, and we struggled to come up for oxygen or, or to kind of step away from the front line far enough to kind of logically think it through. Um, I wish we had had kind of those types of foresight uh, before the project happened. Um, you know, yeah, there's lots of things that we would have done differently in hindsight. We wouldn't have charged through after that lockdown. We would have just taken it on the chin. Um, but I guess we kind of fell into the uh, trap of thinking that the, the consultation up until then had seemed to go well and um, that it was the right thing to do. But yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. And I think with technology changing the way that it is, that, that might be something which is easier to do in the future. That's the, uh, I, was, I, was, I was paying quite close attention to some of the things you were talking about there. And, you know, it's the unknown unknowns that can trip us up uh, quite a lot of the time. And, and when you were talking about, well, actually these are the, you know, these are where the car's coming from. But the problem is, is that if you never think about those, then um, it's, it's very difficult to, to control them. 
you know, and um, and what is the uncertainty in this project, and, and how and how do we map it out? Uh, but yeah, that's that's complex problem solving uh, at its finest. Um, if you if you can work out how to do that, there's another question which uh, John has indicated that he would like to answer. Uh, so I'll give you a minute to pop on your camera and microphone there, John. And it says, uh, what is the problem with rat running if people are following the speed limit and driving safely? I, I suppose that Peter probably has the data on that, but um, it's that's never the the case. Is that if people are trying to shortcut the main main route? Um, then they're trying to save time. They're they're doing what in transport modeling is called user optimal routing, and they're going to be speeding. So, um, and most of the innovating streets projects and now the streets for people projects do include uh, monitoring before and after to determine the speed and volume of traffic. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's bang on. No one ever drew, drove slow on a shortcut. So, if the sole purpose of the shortcut is to beat the traffic on the main road. You're not going to dawdle along at kind of 45 kilometers an hour on the route that Google Maps has told you is going to be better than everyone else. There's that sense that I know something that no one else does. And so I'm going to jump out the other end and beat the traffic. So we did all the monitoring before and after so that we had all of that data. Um, the other thing is those roads aren't designed for that. You know, those, th th those are small, narrow residential streets. Uh, leafy suburbs where kids need to be able to walk to the shops, need to be able to walk to school. Arterial roads are designed for higher volumes. They have different rules around um, entry points and footpaths and visibility. And so, you know, there is only so much the, the rest of the smaller residential system can take before you, we start seeing harm to those that are outside the car. I'd be quite interested to know if there's a way that, and, and, and this is not something that we should be answering in this Q and A session, but um, but whether there's a way that we could be affecting it so that um, unless there was a crash on the motorway and and it was completely chocker, then those alternative routes didn't tend to turn up if that's turning into a big problem. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the challenges we've got, and technology might let us go there. You know, at the moment, Google Maps says the quickest route is change direction and go that way, but it tells everyone the same thing. So, yeah. and one of the things that I started matching up is the Waka Kotahi uh, traffic announcements with when we were having some people complaining about the traffic buildups. And sure enough, when it when I got a notification on my phone to say there's been an accident at Hybra, uh, at the um, Highland Park turn off or whatever, um, choose an alternative route. Sure enough, boom, within half an hour, the east west of people trying to get off the, the southern motorway heading into Spaghetti Junction and everyone trying to get across to State Highway 20, uh, direct correlation. You could match what the, was happening on the motorways. And as soon as that snailed up, it flows into the arterials. And as soon as they fill up, it flows into the residential streets. So yeah, I think with more data and potentially a bit more AI, we could do that. But there are also some physical barriers that we need to put in place. Mm. Um, and a slightly off topic one, uh, but I, I, I think it's quite entertaining. It says, good presentation, Peter. I liked Snowpiercer on Netflix, but the only thing that bothered me all the time as a rail engineer is that the local motive and carriages kept breaking down, but there was never any focus on track maintenance. Um, it's a it's a it's a good series for people, and uh, probably most people on this call will enjoy it because it's it's a fascinating combination of science and well, I mean, some would argue not fiction. The whole premise of the thing is that we're coming to a climate crisis. Only so many people can be saved. Some rich person has shot something up into the atmosphere to try and save the planet. It didn't work, and the entire world is frozen. And so, if you're on these two trains, you're safe. And so these two trains are the only lifelines and they just go round and round the planet. So it's a fascinating insight into kind of, I guess, that bridge between science and science fiction with a climate change mix. And if you're into trains, then you'll love it as well. So highly recommended. Fair enough. Uh, and uh, are low traffic neighbourhoods and only hunger or uh, only hunger slash Auckland still on the agenda? They are a critical tool and we are seeing them working well in the UK. Um, almost always people oppose them. Almost always, if you can leave them in for a certain amount of time, 
people warm to them and almost always uh if you ask someone in two or three years time do you want it removed they will almost always say no no actually leave it in because people don't um they can't visualize what it's like to live in a low traffic neighborhood until they've had it there in the uk they had a real issue with people pulling them out you know politicians i guess losing courage and it got to the point where they had to put in some things where like if it's vandalized the clock starts again it's going to be a one-year trial, and if you vandalize this, we're going to start the clock again. So it's another one year from this day. And that was the only way they could get rid of the vandalism. And sure enough, that allowed people to bet in and get used to it. We had a, I've got a video from someone who said, look, I always thought the solution to our street was Jada bars. But actually, having seen this trial and walked these streets, I realized we just need our street to be a cul-de-sac because the boy racers won't come down our road if, there's, if it's a dead end at the other end, but they will still come down our road if we put in jutter bars. So, but until she had seen that on the ground, she thought she knew the solution to the problem. And it wasn't until we showed her that in the real world, she realized there was an alternative. So uh, it will be a critical tool as we move forward. And the irony is there's actually hundreds of them around the place. They just were installed at, an, at a time and place where social media didn't allow people to complain about it quite so much. Mm. Uh, and following in the in the spirit of the uh, of this webinar series, what would you do differently now? What lessons have you learned? And and if you were going to be, uh, you know, if you could go back and and have the same, you know, with the knowledge that you have now, what would you do differently? Yeah, great question, and one that all of us involved in the project and and the bigger program um, reflected on. Um, there were some time pressures that were there last time round, which were modified for this time round. So now Waka Kotahi run a program called Streets for People. I guess it's the next evolution of innovating streets. Um, it's over two or three years as opposed to one year. Um, I think you always need to be trying to find people who don't think like you. So, you know, we were naturally drawing people pre-implementation. We were drawing people who were supportive of the project. And it wasn't until you installed the project, you started to hear from the people that were against it. And what you struggle to then do is balance the, uh, the sentiment because all of a sudden you're getting a wave of negative and you're trying to match that. Well, we're not hearing from any of the positive people anymore. And that's because you've actually already heard from them and they don't realize that they actually need to keep coming back to you. And we got to a point where it was looking like the project was going to be pulled early. And you're sitting there go, well, hang on a minute. We've told everyone the trial will be in place for six months. All the people that like this are expecting to be able to provide feedback at the end of the six months. It's only the angry people that are getting in touch in the first two or three months. So how do we balance that, that immediate demand for change versus those that trust the system and that trust the process that was out outlined and therefore are still waiting? Um, and social media does kind of cloud, I guess, our judgment as decision makers um, of what that looks like. But the program at a higher level um, has learnt lots of lessons about the need for comms. Uh, it's almost a crisis comms as opposed to a PR kind of um, marcoms um, element. Um, health and well-being is critical. We had lots of people burning out during those projects last time around, and so health and well-being is 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 a fundamental part of the streets. For now, the Streets for People team did a lot of work on funding the foundations and actually building confidence with councils that they are ready because lots of councils felt hesitant to go into battle again. So lots more work was done around resilience and making sure that those guys were ready and up for what was coming. And it's likely that low traffic neighbourhoods is probably a tool that has maybe shifted to later in the decade. I, I doubt that we will see many low traffic neighborhoods for the next couple of years until we take the public on a journey to where they start to ask for that type of solution rather than I guess the technical engineers and transport planners saying, this is the solution you need. We've got to strike that balance um, because there's no, there is no social license if you force the installation without the comms or if the comms over promises and doesn't match to the installation. And uh, going back to the, I think that one of the key things that, you know, we need to take away from this as, uh, as engineers and, and just as, you know, people in general, is, uh, is, is about the mental health side of things. And, and I was in a meeting yesterday where, uh, where it was said that 
uh, they found that during the initial COVID crisis, um, one in three people started suffering from burnout, right? And burnout at its most extreme is, you know, where you do end up in hospital and, and it can take months to recover. Uh, and, and so for you personally, you know, if, if you were going to be giving your, yourself from back then some advice on how to deal with that sort of, those sorts of pressures, um, what would you, uh, what would you suggest? Yeah. Um, it, it has left scars. So not just the surgery scars, but, um, you know, I was asked to house sit in Oninghanga over the Christmas New Year period. And for the first couple of days, I was kind of having panic attacks anytime I'd walk out to their front letterbox um, because I was always fearful that when I walked out onto the streets to go to the cafe or whatever, that I was going to come across one of these people who'd tagged my name on a fence or had threatened me um, online or sent me emails or voice, mail, uh, voice messages. Um, over a few days, that kind of eased off, and that was because I was with my family, etc. But only a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a cycling movie, a community movie um, showing in Onihanga, and I got up and I tried to speak about how critical um, advocacy for cycling is if we're going to reduce carbon emissions and transport. And it all started coming back. And I was kind of weeping in front of this public audience who I knew very few of them. And I had my five-year-old daughter with me and she was kind of like latched onto my leg. And I kind of realized I, I, the physical part had gone, but the, but the, the post-traumatic stress was still there. And I still have issues that I need to work through about putting myself into those conflict situations, even though it was in front of a welcoming audience who were supportive and, and my people, um, just talking about activism and courage and challenging the system kind of I got that kind of lump in my throat so yeah mental health is critical for projects where you're you're trying to change a system because change is hard and so climate change is hard and the change needed to reduce emissions is going to be really hard because we're asking people to change something that they're really comfortable with uh, COVID is going to have a hangover effect in so many ways uh, we don't need to be talking about a COVID related project for that trauma to still come through in other ways um, on a positive note, uh, we have uh, from Nerissa a, a conversation, uh, a, a note saying, really great presentation, Peter. It's a shame you won't be going back to only hang around anytime soon, but you have been. Um, every local I spoke to loved the low traffic neighbourhood and were really disappointed they were vandalised. It begs the question, how do we help bring the vocal minority who oppose these, screen, these schemes on the journey? Get out and vote. Get out and vote. Local government elections are coming up. Um, this is a topic which I can already see being a tinderbox for Onihanga residents. Um, you know, the flyers from the political party, which I'm not a party of, uh, part of, are already making comments like a common sense approach to transport. So this will become, unfortunately, something which divides Onihanga um, in the next local government election. So you can vote without putting your head above the parapet and being abused on Facebook. You can vote for people that are supportive of things that you're passionate about. And so, um, yeah, I had lots of people come up to me and say, look, I wish I had the courage to do what you do, or I wish I had the courage even to take people on on Facebook. Um, people have lost friends in Onihanga at the school gate because of this project. Um, I heard of one couple that almost divorced over it because the husband liked the project and the wife didn't. So, you know, this is a topic Climate change is causing a lot of stress to a lot of people, but um, please encourage people to vote. Make sure you learn about who you are voting for um, because these projects are gonna become more and more determined by who you put in decision-making positions. And, uh, and a well-liked uh, comment from, from Tim, he says, not a question, but a comment. Much respect to Peter for your vulnerability and sharing the health drama with uh, um, high heart rate. And also your vulnerability in sharing that negative feedback, e.g. the graffiti. Sounds like complex engineering plus consultation effort, plus consultation issues we grapple with, but we're still human. Um, couldn't agree more. Sorry, um, scrolling down through the... 
Um, mostly comments from there on, and I think, oh no, here we go. Uh, so with the Streets for People program, what is Waka Kotahi doing to surprise, to, to, sorry, let me start that again. With the Streets for People program, what is Waka Kotahi doing to provide support to manage situation when these types of issues arise again? Yeah, so that, um, again, going back to the lessons, uh, when the debrief was done afterwards with all of the projects across the whole country, it came through really strongly that while councils appreciated the opportunity to deliver these projects, they really struggled not having the, the air cover that a national agency could have provided. So Waka Kotahi traditionally is a funder and councils deliver. Um, this project in hindsight needed, uh, um, I guess, a closer level of um, guardianship from Waka Kotahi and that's what we're seeing with Streets for People. So the messages back from council was we can't fight these fires street corner from street corner with garden hoses. We need the monsoon bucket, the national messaging around innovating streets is trying to do this, this and this. It's coming to a town near you, you know, work with your local councils instead of the councils having to have that conversation and kind of scream and say, hey, this is a really important project. Um, it needed to have that national cover. So this time around, it's a much more national conversation. Uh, lots of work around resiliency, lots of work around dealing with conflict, lots of work around um, key messaging and how to present things. Um, Jess Berents and Shaw has done a lot of work uh, through her organization, the workshop around what mes messages resonate with which people. You know, you need to deliver the right message at the right time um, to the right person with the right messenger and sometimes I was a, a red rag to a bull uh, talking to some of these Facebook groups who just didn't want me answering the question regardless of the fact that I might be the only one with the answer so uh, there's lots of lessons that have been learned to really build that resilience and hopefully we should see a, a much more successful rollout over the next couple of years um, I think the minister is announcing those uh, in the next week or so uh, where those projects will be around the country. Right. And uh, was there any possibility of reinstating the traffic control devices after they were removed? And can you share more about that situation and the responses considered? Yes, I mean, they were getting removed almost immediately. Um, so I was often going back and kind of pushing them back over or I had locals kind of who were supportive of the campaign, keeping an eye out for them, uh, you know, shoving boxes back to where they were. They were getting nudged out of the way uh, by utes and other vehicles. And that was a daily thing. Every morning we were going back and tipping them back over, putting them back, putting them back, putting them back. Um, but the day the guys brought in the forklift and the prior bars, it kind of got a bit real for everyone. And um, the reality was they undid basically like three weeks of installation. They undid it in 45 minutes. I was staggered. I was like, who are these guys? How do I hire them? Um, because it was just amazing with the couple of little video angles that people threw up on TikTok, how quickly they were getting rid of this stuff that we had spent hours painstakingly positioning to make sure it met all the rules and regulations and distances from curbs and all this sort of stuff. And they didn't care. They just ripped it all out. So um you know, a lesson for materials. I think a couple of other low traffic neighborhoods ended up using concrete blocks instead of the wooden boxes that we used. They were fruit crates. They kept about five or six guys employed during a slow period of COVID um, who would have been making wooden boxes for fruit. You know, but there were so many good parts about the using the wooden boxes, um, but in hindsight, we should have just made it brutal and, and just put in super heavy concrete blocks and painted them a nice color. Someone would have still complained about the colour we chose, but at least they wouldn't have moved. And uh, having a road access management system is important. Where roads are classified based on their function. Residential roads should never carry that much traffic. Uh, their residential roads are not only for mobility purposes, but at rather access to your home. A road's function is important. Sorry, I didn't. Or yeah. system, well, no, and so the, one of the criticisms, I know I've only got a couple of minutes left, one of the criticisms from some people with low traffic neighbourhoods is it's denying me the right to, to get to my house. But low traffic neighbourhoods don't stop you from going anywhere. 
like you can get to where you want to go. It might just take a little bit longer. You might just kind of have to go around the block. Um, and that's because we need to stop the through traffic, which is unnecessary and shouldn't be in that place. So yeah, um, you know, one network framework, the NOF, the, the network planning that goes into these things are, are critical. But the challenge that I guess planners have had is that they've been a little bit um, laissez fear about what the consequences of that planning are, because it very rarely gets down to the person in the house having to look out their front door, because if it's a constant stream of traffic outside your front door, you're not going to feel safe walking, you're going to get in your car and join that stream of traffic and add to the congestion. Whereas if you open the curtains in the morning and there's no cars, you're much more likely to walk or bike to your destination, because you don't feel like you've got to wrap yourself in a metal box to join to join that traffic, which you see when you open the curtains. So it's really important, the psychology as well as just the technical kind of planning elements. Mm, um, speaking from personal experience, I know that during the first COVID lockdown, there was virtually no traffic on the streets. And uh, my wife and my kids and I, you know, walked and cycled an unprecedented amount, which we haven't done since because um, there were just no cars around. It was, uh, it was great. But, uh, and the last one that we have time for today is uh, the term social license is very ambiguous and outsources responsibility for decision making to a general unknown collective of people. With more of these projects getting underway across the country, how can we avoid kicking the multitude of hornet's nests uh, rather than relying on this abstract term for us to act? Is there a database of communities that really want low traffic neighbourhoods? Uh, possibly. Uh, so in Walton Forest in the UK, I'll try and wrap this up quickly, uh, it was decided that they were going to use this tool, but what they did is they kept the pulse of the different communities, and as soon as they felt through their surveying that the community were getting a little bit cool on the idea, they'd just say, look, it looks like you've got a little bit more, you need a little bit more time to have a think about this, we're going to go and work over in that next neighbourhood over and get back to us when you're ready. And what that did is it forced the community to kind of look inward and say, well, actually, do we want to do this or not? And then they look over to the neighbors and all of a sudden their kids are running around on the street having a great time and they get themselves organized and they start to lobby to get the project back there. So the opposition we got was people complaining, saying, why do they get special treatment? Why isn't my neighborhood getting chosen? And then people inside the neighborhood saying, well, why did you choose me? Why didn't you do it somewhere else? So you were constantly in this friction between people's own frustration with things that were being changed, either through jealousy of them not getting the special treatment or through frustration that they were getting special treatment. So it was a, back to your complex problem scenario. It was really difficult to get to the bottom of why it was possible. And I think it's a political thing as to whether or not you're on the right and you see yourself as a voice for the current people that are elected you, or if you're on the left and you're a progressive who's thinking about the next generation, that then makes it hard to make decisions in this space because social license for someone who's more conservative will be very different to social license for someone who's more progressive. True. And look, uh, there are a, there is such a huge number of uh, positive comments. So look, uh, congratulations on your on your presentation, particularly because I know you expanded it out from a five minute talk. And uh, and and thank you very much. I really appreciate it. The questions that are still there, um, you know, we we will still we will send all of the comments and so on through to Peter, and so that he can uh, reply to them and and answer them in the case study that we that we publish along with this presentation. But for me, I'd just like to say, look, it was a, it was a great presentation. Uh, I really appreciate it and, uh, and the time that you've taken to do it, sharing your experiences and, um, and you know, openly uh, uh, talking about, you know, um, feelings and, and the way that things have affected us as uh, not something that we've done particularly well in the past, but we seem to be getting better and better at it. So. I applaud you for um, for being able to do that today. Uh, on another note, uh, as I said before, we are looking for um, you know another webinar for uh, next month. And so the railways engineer, potentially, if you would like to be talking about something about maintenance and um, and common failures due to maintenance, please please reach out and let us know. There and uh, but on that, I will say thank you very much and. Um, and let everybody get back to work. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you.